So what are we going to talk about? Uh, I know what you'll do next summer. So I'll try and give you a bit of an idea of, um, of what you can do with machine learning, and more specifically, what you can do with uh, machine learning using unstructured data. Uh, because that happens to be something that we are very interested in ourselves and that we, and, uh, together with our partners, have been working on over the past year. So I'll be talking you through first a little bit of what machine learning is, how you can do that uh, based on our platform, and then I'll talk you through two use cases that we've, uh, that we've worked on the, in, the, in the recent past. So first, what is machine learning? Um, it's, a, it's a hip term. Uh, lots of people like to use it, also varieties of it like uh, deep learning, and calling those varieties is probably very, uh, very impolite and very unprofessional. But anyhow, I'll try and give you some sort of an idea of what machine learning is all about. And I'll try to do that because we're about to head into a casino night by explaining you um, a board game. Anybody who recognizes this game? Yes, ah, I love you, Alessandro. It is the best board game ever. It's called Robo Rally. And it's, um, it's a terrific board game. It, it, you are programming a bot like these. The ones I have at home are, um, in, a, in the past, they were, uh, they were painted more brilliantly than these, but they've worn off because I use it so often. Um, so you control one of these bots and you let them run around on a factory floor. So the, board, uh, the boards are factory floors with things like uh, conveyor belts, gears that turn around, there's pits that you can fall into, there's, uh, there's oil spills, and it's, 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 ra it's rather fun boards. And you have to program your bots by using cards. So you get these sorts of cards at the start of, the at the start of every turn. Um, typically, you would get nine cards, and the cards tell you what you can do with your bot, like move one, one uh, square forward, turn left, turn right, make a U-turn, move two steps forward. And with those nine cards, you have to assemble a program, a program of five phases. And then, as soon as everybody has kind of assembled this program, and obviously, if you are the last one, your, uh, your dear co-players will encourage you to make haste. But you're, so you're, everybody moves at the same time. So everybody's first move happens, everybody has to turn his first card simultaneously, and all the bots move at the, at, the same, uh, at the same time. So that's where the fun starts. Because you may have found out, you may have programmed your bot to make a, make a great move and arrive at the, the next waypoint, but if another bot kind of crosses your path and pushes you one, one square to the left or to the right, your, your program may be completely inappropriate and you end up in a, in a pit or you speed off the board and that's where, that's um, the fun of this very cruel board game, obviously. So now, um, why am I explaining this? This is, this is programming. This is programming, and even very blunt programming, because you can't even put a, an if-then-else statement that says, if I'm in front of a pit, don't move forward. So there's no way how you can, how you can put that in your program. You really have to just live with it. So that's, that's programming. That's definitely not machine learning. This is something else. This is a car, a supposedly self-driving car that, um, that drives around uh, in the same state as we are in right now, just a little bit further onto the north. It's not as good looking as the, the bots we saw in RoboRally, but it's also a robot. So it also does something. There's some programming that went into this thing, and it moves around. Um, now, this, the sort of programming that went into this robot compared to the sort of programming that went into the RoboRally robots is completely different, of course. These robots are not programmed to move one square forward, then make a left turn, and then move three squares forward. These robots are, um, it's not their actual behavior that's programmed. It's, um, they put something prior to that in, the, in, in terms of programming. So they, they put software in there that tells the car to kind of, okay, if you make a left turn here and you crash into a, car, uh, into a tree, that was not a good idea. So it's kind of behavioral, it, it, it's, it's meant to kind of learn from the things that it tries through what is typically called reinforced learning. Um, and so it's, it's learning on the job. And so the more it drives, the more it tries, the more it learns about what actually would have been the right path to get from A to B. So this is vastly different, obviously, from what we did with our bots in the, in the Robo Rally game, but this is much smarter because here you're only, you're only kind of giving the system clues of how it, how it can react to, to, to things that it finds out, but it is, um, rather than having to implement 
uh, or having to program all the individual steps. So this one can make much more complex things than just move around on the, the playing board of RoboRally. Now, obviously, um, these things are also, uh, have been driving for quite a while, and that's what should make you comf more comfortable if you ever set foot in these cars, because you'll probably feel more comfortable in those if they've driven around the entire state of California than if they've only been driving on the, the, the driveway on, uh, on Mountain View at Google's headquarters. So why is that relevant? Because it kind of implies that the more you drive, the, the better these cars get, the more they learn. So the more data they try their moves on, the more, um, the more training they go through, the better they get at things. So that's kind of a natural thing, and that, that also accounts somewhat for playing Robo Rally. Um, but it really is very important in this machine learning area that the more you, the more you can train, the more you can learn from, the better your models are, uh, are supposedly getting. So that's, that's kind of a, a uh, sort of first introduction into what the difference between, uh, between programming and machine learning is. So now, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so after that little analogy of, uh, for describing the difference between programming and machine learning, let's take a closer look at what, that, um, what, what sort of workflows and tools are actually involved in, uh, in this broader kind of analytics space. So let's first start by looking at uh, the data. So if you want to do any analytics at all, eventually culminating into machine learning, you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start by collecting that data, by capturing it and then storing it in a platform that allows you to get the data back out again, because putting it in is, is one thing, but getting it out is, uh, is yet another thing. So capturing the data typically starts on the left-hand side here by capturing it, the data in a very raw format. And then eventually, uh, probably most analytics will be taking place on a, a more or less curated data, curated version of that data. So lots of different tools and, 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 and platforms in this, uh, in this area, ranging from, uh, from bare-bone file systems or distributed file systems such, a, such as Hadoop, uh, all the way to multi-model databases such as InterSystems Iris. Now, storing the data is one thing, getting it from that raw end on the left, which may be a different system than the one that you eventually work on, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, getting it from, that, from the left to the right uh, requires data processing. There's uh, tools such as uh, uh, Hadoop's MapReduce that allow you to do that on HDFS, but there's also much more powerful frameworks like Apache Spark that can help you do some processing, but also ETL tools or just uh, SQL stored procedures are all means of kind of getting that data from a raw format in, uh, in how it was captured into a sort of a curated analytics friendly format. So that's, that's kind of getting ready to do the actual uh, analytics. So doing the actual analytics typically starts with uh, sort of an exploratory phase, using tools, uh, again, like SQL or more exploratory tools like, um, like, uh, like DeepC or, or I know to go through unstructured data to kind of get a, bit of the, get a bit of a better sense of the distribution of your data. What's specific in here? What can I expect? Are there any outliers that I need to get rid of? And typically this phase will kind of feed back into that processing workflow and it's sort of an iterative thing because you learn about particular, uh, particular patterns or particular uh, data points that you want to get rid of, that you want to exclude from, from the analysis. So, so the exploring, going back to processing, uh, that's, uh, that's an iterative uh, piece of the, of the workflow. Then kind of a natural next step after the exploration is, is kind of going into business analytics or business intelligence. So whereas exploring was really looking at the data in more or less its original form, uh, I try to kind of draw the line between exploration and analytics and business analytics as um, kind of curating your, da curating your data, uh, building sort of a, an analytics model out of it uh, with, for example, with dimensions and, and, and measures as in a deep sea cube. Um, so you're presenting the, your end users no longer with the full data set in its original vastness, but you're, you're showing more a 
a subset that has been organized in a, in a way that makes it easier to consume. And that go, could go all the way up to building dashboards and, and ad hoc reporting that gets you, that, or that sends you email as soon as certain thresholds are, are reached. So that's, that's that sort of business intelligence analytics sort of, um, sort of stage. Tools in this area range all the way from, uh, let's say, the dashboarding features of DeepSea uh, over uh, other tools like Oracle BI, uh, ClickView, Tableau. So all tools that are more oriented towards a, uh, an end user uh, audience that doesn't necessarily want to roll up their sleeve and, 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 and get their hands on the keyboard to do any, any querying themselves, but prefer to work with, a, uh, with the mouse and look at interesting aggregations. So that's exploration, and then the next sort of stage in a workflow would be uh, machine learning. So that's after you've, you have a really good feel of what your data looks like, of what, your, uh, what, what things there are to, uh, to, to zoom in on. You may want to try and, and kind of grasp the patterns, grasp the correlations that are in your, um, in, in your data set. So that's what machine learning is all about throwing some compute resources at it and letting the machine uh, identify those patterns for you based on, um, based on the data itself, actually, and the more the better. So that's typically working on data that has already been, 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 been processed a little bit. That's, um, so, so trying to identify the, the features that really make sense. And after you've been able to eventually capture such a model, um, you obviously want to be able to apply it somewhere in your production flow. So that's the prediction stage. So that's where, uh, that's where a standard like PUML can help you in, uh, in getting, the, getting it from the machine learning tools, tool sets such as uh, Spark's machine learning library, SystemML, uh, and others, um, exporting it from that environment and turning it into something that you can then import and leverage in your production environment. So, Diving into a little more specifics of this machine learning stage, which we're going to talk about more in, the, in this session. Um, so the goals here are really to identify the correlations between a desired out, outcome, so uh, a particular output field, and all of the other presumably independent input fields. So it's not all just the, 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 the magical work of, of identifying these. So zooming in a little bit here, so the, the goals of that machine learning area in the, in the broader analytics galaxy is to identify correlations, try to kind of capture the, 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 the formulas, capture the, the dependencies between the outcome that you want to predict, the outcome that you want to um, come up with, and the input features that your sensors, that, your, your, that the, the inputs, the independent variables that you, you could start from. Um, apart from the, the, the eureka moment when you've really captured and canned that formula uh, that expresses this pattern. There's also the less uh, sexy, but uh, at least as important uh, step uh, of defining derived features, defining other uh, uh, predictors that, that have a higher predictive value and get you closer to that eventual formula. So tools in this area, there are uh, some very powerful tools like R as a programming language, Spark machine learning libraries, working on top of uh, Apache Spark. Uh, system ML as sort of an abstraction layer originally uh, developed by IBM that will allow you to work at a slightly more abstract level and then uh, leave, I forward the implementation to, for example, Spark or other uh, uh, more heavy handed um, deployment tools or implementation uh, packages. Uh, Python SkyKit, or, or however you pronounce it, is another sort of framework that offers you very powerful. Uh, algorithms for doing machine learning. Then a couple of more, let's say, end user style products like SAS, SPSS, NIME are really kind of uh, IDE-like tools that give you an environment where you can point and click and work with your mouse. And then the, the difference between those two, if there is a difference at all, is sort of the, 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 the level or the trade-off that's being made between uh, flexibility. Uh, obviously, R gives you a lot of flexibility, has a lot of packages that you can tap into. Um, and usability. Well, it may give you a thousand packages, but if you have to kind of um, load them all by hand and, and invoke them through uh, obscure code, that's, uh, that's not as practical. So finding the balance between, uh, between that usability and flexibility is certainly 
uh, is certainly something that kind of differentiates these tools from one another. Another challenge for these tools is to abstract the complexity underneath. So, um, for example, taking the example of R, uh, there's, a, there's an official repository of uh, the CRAN, uh, a repository of, of, of R um, algorithms. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, a broad variety of, uh, of, of, of quality in those, in those implementations, but how are you gonna find out which is the best one to use? So if a tool can take care of that for you and can uh, abstract that complexity for you, that's also a, a great, uh, great advantage of, uh, of, of, of potential tool for machine learning. Of course, being able to deal with non-structured data, being able to deal with large volumes of data, those are also differentiators in this machine learning market. And then finally, being able to take those models out of your machine learning environment and being able to deploy them in your production environment is yet another important aspect uh, in the machine learning environment. So, now, what does that mean in terms of technology support at, uh, at InterSystems? Some of you who've seen me present on earlier occasions will recognize this diagram, but the, the general idea that we wanna, or the general strategy that we wanna position with InterSystems Iris for analytics is to provide you with an open analytics platform, a platform that allows you to choose the tools that you like uh, and allows those tools to take advantage of the underlying data store, which still is the kind of central piece of, of everything we have to offer, the central kind of, p the cornerstone of our data platform. But on top of that, we will offer you a couple of embedded technologies, the ones in blue, the things that we develop ourselves, like DeepSea and Ino, BI and text analytics technologies that can, that solve particular needs in this broad spectrum of analytics, but also, allow you to work with other tools that buy support for industry standards like PUML for predictive analytics and UEMA for unstructured data processing um, and through support for third party tool, tools like Apache Spark. So I mentioned that the InterSystems Iris database sits at the very core of this open analytics platform. It's a multi-workload tool, so we're not limiting you to, uh, to only serve transactional purposes, but also uh, have specific features in there to scale for, for analytic workloads. It's multi-model, very helpful if you remember that diagram with uh, raw data on the one end and curated data on the other end. If you can stay within one database, within one data platform, that's clearly an asset, that's clearly something that will, uh, will, will make your um, your, your workflow easier. And then being able to scale uh, horizontally uh, is also something that allows you to deal with very large data sets, which we've seen is very interesting if you wanna do some machine learning and wanna be able to have models that are robust uh, because they need relevant training data. So zooming in a little bit on some of the analytics capabilities um, that we provide on top of that. So InterSystems Iris Business Intelligence, formerly known as Deep Sea, and probably will be known for deep, uh, as deep sea for quite a while to come, gives you strong out of the box exploration capabilities. It's very easy to start from a table and then uh, identify your measures, identify your dimensions, and then explore the model that comes out of it. So it's, it's good to kind of get a better feeling of your data before you dive into the machine learning pieces. Then our Apache Spark connector, uh, for which there is a, an experience lab running there's one more edition of it tomorrow. If you're interested to uh, roll up your sleeves and give it a try, uh, feel free to register. Um, and with, Apache Spark, with the Apache Spark connector com also comes uh, an interesting library of um, machine learning algorithms. So Spark ML uh, brings quite a few interesting things to the table and because it's built on top of this uh, data set paradigm that Apache Spark brings, you can, uh, you can really benefit from the, the things that we put in our connector. And then our support for PMML, which has been in the product already for a while, um, allows you to kind of close that loop and take models that are developed in the machine learning phase and uh, kind of pick it up in, uh, in your production environment. So then a fourth piece of that uh, open analytics platform is our support for text analytics. With, uh, with Ino as being as at, the, at, the, at the center of it. So I wanted to also put a, another uh, picture in to kind of illustrate the fact that a lot of data is unstructured. 
by uh, showing, uh, the, giving the example of a psychiatrist and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a couch. But I, I, when I looked at for images of a psychiatrist from here in uh, Desert Springs, it, I, um, or Palm Desert, I only got images of uh, people in military uniforms. I don't know whether what sort of crazy uh, location-specific search uh, results that were, but anyhow, when I looked for couch, I only saw ugly couches. Not sure if that's related to the location. But anyhow, so the point I wanted to make with that is that you can, you can learn many things from structured data. For example, going back to that, uh, the example of the self-driving car, uh, there's a lot of sensor data that's already in a nice structured format coming at you. But if you are a psychiatrist and you want to build a model that helps you predict what your, what your customer or what your uh, patient is suffering from, um, there's hardly any structured data that you're going to get out of your patients. They just talk, um, if you're lucky. So they just talk and they, they give you, they will talk to you about all of the things that happen to them. But that, that data is in, is in a natural language format that is very, um, very, very valuable because it contains perspective, it contains some hidden clues, there's some thought that went into the, the, the speaking or the, the, the text that's being produced, but it's not easy to kind of get that information back out. So that's what we developed our iNo engine for, to unravel the things or the, the, the concepts that are in, uh, in natural language text. So another piece in the, in the text analytics uh, family is the UEMA integration, which uh, Jos will be delivering a flash talk about tomorrow. That allows you to, that's an industry standard for unstructured data processing, and it, um, it really helps you in kind of, in a structured way, uh, combine different NLP tools to, to build new features that can be used in machine learning workflows. So zooming in, in that, uh, into iNo, or InterSystems Iris NLP, um, Many tools in the, in the NLP area are very much focused on the word level. And that's fine uh, because it's easy, and it's, uh, it's easy to deal with words if you're looking at very large volumes of texts. Um, but it fails to capture a lot of important information that is available in, your, in, in the sentence. So for example, a sentence about bird flu is very different than a sentence just about bird or about flu. As a sentence about Facebook ads does not necessarily have anything to do with the company uh, Facebook. And also it, uh, it, it fails to, I, the word level alone is not enough to know whether something is negated, whether something is in a positive sentimental context or not. So the word level is inherently limited. Also many other tools are based on sort of a predefined taxonomy of things you wanna, you wanna look for. That works well if you have a, a very clear idea of what you're looking for, but very often you do not have that up front, or your ID may be a bit biased towards, you, to, towards what, you, what you think your, your, your for example, uh, in the psychiatry context, uh, if, you're, if you're looking for particular, um, particular terms, your patient may be describing what he's, uh, what he's feeling in very different terms from what you are expecting him to describe. So by starting from a predefined dictionary, you may, you may be missing a lot of uh, things that um, that are hidden in the text otherwise. So, InterSystems Iris NLP uses a unique bottom-up approach to get at these things. So we only take the language as, a, as our input or the thing that we take for granted. And we will just uh, leverage our knowledge and our understanding of the grammar of the language to kind of bring up those concepts. And as sort of an example, this is uh, from, a, uh, from a use case we'll get at, the second use case we'll be talking about shortly. So we were looking at references to companies. And um, so for example, references to, to the, the, the company Facebook in order to identify uh, which records were related to, uh, to companies in order to track their, uh, their, their, their performance. So there were many hits or many uh, the, the uses of the word Facebook. But if you look at all of the concepts um, you'll see that quite a few of those concepts, almost half of the, 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 the occurrences of the actual word Facebook were not about the company Facebook or not likely about the company Facebook, but about advertisement campaigns posted to Facebook. So linking all of these to the company Facebook when trying to kind of make 
deductions about the, the, the corporate performance of Facebook would clearly have, uh, have induced quite a few false positives or, uh, or, or just noise, added noise to our, to our input data. And then another example from the same, uh, from the same use case is here where we're not just kind of bringing up uh, concepts, but also or not just bringing up that, well, disaster is probably sort of a, a negative term and um, brand new is maybe positive or better shaped than, uh, is, is also very positive, but we're also identifying to which pieces of the sentence that that sentiment or that negation is, uh, is applying. So that's what the colors are, are all about. So being able to kind of capture that, that's also something for which you need to have an understanding of the grammar rather than just um, uh, the, the ability to cut up a sentence into mere words. Okay, that was a, a bit of a rushed overview of what, uh, what I know brings to the table. Now let's take a look at um, two different use cases. So the first one is about patient risk models. And uh, Frank from uh, HBI Solutions is, uh, is in the room, so he can correct me anytime I say anything wrong about HBI Solutions. Uh, so HBI Solutions is a, is a company based out of Palo Alto near San Francisco who are building, um, who are providing predictive analytics solutions uh, that take their data from HealthShare Health Insight. They, um, they take data out of Health Insight, they feed that into an analytics workflow that also in, in includes Apache Spark and then produces risk models that for a wide range of, uh, of, of, of diagnosis or, or risk factors uh, gives you a likelihood that that patient is going to uh, suffer from that particular disease or is going to be readmitted within uh, a particular uh, time span. So they've got deployments that, uh, that cover uh, over 20 million patients. And together with them, we were looking at the possibility to not only take the structured data out of Health Insight, but also include the unstructured data from Health Insight and use InterSystems Iris NLP or I know to, uh, to kind of uh, capture the concepts in there and use those as input features for those predictive models. Um, we didn't want to just stick to uh, mere occurrences of concepts. We also wanted to include the context. So we, we, uh, we also captured negation. We captured family history context for those concepts and then use that to build a model for hypertension probability or the probability of attracting hypertension within one year. So this is how their workflow looked like before. So blue means default intersystems components, orange means default HBI components. So starting from the, the HealthShare Health Insight tables, also, uh, for which the package name is still HSAA from Active Analytics. So they have a, a very powerful ETL flow that kind of picks all of the, the interesting pieces of data from the Health Insight tables and puts that puts that into a, a large feature table. That table is then pivoted into a SAM table uh, and then that information is fed into their machine learning workflow and actually this, this thing should actually be three slides wide to be uh, proportional uh, but eventually that results into a model that can be expressed in PUML and fed back into uh, the cache environment. So what do we do? We extended that workflow a bit and while still using the same ETL workflow to capture the structured pieces, the stu structured features, we also looked specifically at the HSAA document table and uh, tried to make sense of the data in there. As um, if you've ever used, um, if you've ever looked at uh, clinical notes in a, in, in a regular EHR system, you'll know that it's not just one nice bit of prose. There's always going to be these little form-like things, a bit of headers, a bit of footers, like um, history of present illness, then a list of medications. So there's a lot of semi-structured data in those files. So that's where we built a bit of custom pre-processing logic to split up, uh, to, to kind of parse out the, the real text pieces and the, the kind of key value-like pieces of information, so the sort of uh, semi-structured pieces that we were able to uh, identify. So we apply INO to the, the, the text pieces and then we've got the classic structured features, the I know concepts annotated with concept, context, and we've got the key value pieces that we also got out of those concepts. And that 
all was again fit into through the pivoting um, through that pivoting step fed into their machine learning workflow, which now suddenly had an explosion of, uh, of input features, but was able to cope well with that, and now results in a new model, a new predictive model for hypertension one year. So without having to write too much new code, too much custom code, we were able to kind of extend that workflow to also include unstructured data. Results? Um, so thus far, we've been working on a limited data set. Um, we have uh, fairly good performance, and we found a couple of very interesting things to look at. So, uh, so what this table tells you is, uh, so at the top here, you see sort of bins of the probability of attracting hypertension, and then how many, uh, how many patients were in those bins, and how many actually had the, the diagnosis registered in the structure data. So as you can see, there were 103 that had a 10 to 15% likelihood of, uh, of, of, of having hypertension, of which 14 actually were diagnosed with hypertension. So the, the remaining 89 are very interesting to, to take a closer look at. So are those the ones that were, were lucky and, uh, and just didn't attract um, hypertension, or are those ones that weren't diagnosed for one reason or another? So we found a couple of, I, so this, this, this gave some really good uh, input to kind of take a closer look, see if there was, were some gaps between the official diagnosis fields and uh, what we could find in the notes. But at this point in time, we're still waiting for the full data set to be made available and have some real kind of um, sensible performance metrics for the model. To give you a sense of the NLP features we were, look, we were using, uh, so these were some of the, the concepts we included in the model. Uh, so for some, the, uh, we only included them when they were annotated with family history context or where they, when they were annotated with a negative context. Um, so these were some of, the, some of the features that were used. So in a fully automated way, which is why you can see a couple of, well, you could say duplicates like diabetes mellitus and DM, which actually is the same thing but then uh, in an acronym format. But we, we chose not to kind of um, uh, wise guide the data and just let the, the, let the statistics, let the machine learning speak for itself uh, and, uh, and, and use the, the features right how they came out of the, the feature selection workflow. On the key value side, these were some of the key value pairs that we found had, a, had good correlation or had good predictive value to be included into the model as well. So, so that was the, the use case we worked on with HBI. Uh, as I mentioned, we're still, uh, we're still waiting for a, for a full data set to kind of recalibrate the model and be able to make some, uh, some more sensible conclusions. Second use case is about uh, sentiment detection in the financial industry. So for this case, use case, we work together with Extract Alpha, who is a uh, small consulting firm based out of Hong Kong, who are uh, dedicated to providing customers with advice on, uh, on, on quantitative financial research. So rather than focus on technology, they really focus on the, the research, on the expertise, on the, the, well, just being able to make sense of, uh, of data. And where they previously had worked primarily with structured data, uh, we were now kind of borrowing their minds to take a look at uh, some unstructured, some very in interesting unstructured data. That unstructured data came from a, um, a research provider who typically creates uh, quarterly reports uh, based on interviews with uh, people from a certain industry, but rather than looking at the vendors themselves or rather looking at the, the companies themselves, they look at the supply chain. They look at uh, resellers, at suppliers, and um, by kind of interviewing those, you get more of an honest, uh, a, a more on the ground s uh, sort of perspective of how, the, how these companies are doing. Um, what many academics and, and other firms are looking at is by looking at uh, earning call transcripts. So quarterly updates presented by CEOs and CFOs about how well the company is doing. And those, those earning calls, they typically have a fixed structure starting with a presentation where the CFO presents how well they've done. Uh, and then there's a Q&A part where analysts are uh, invited to ask questions. And if you look at sentiment in those, it's very predictable. 
you can, uh, the, so the presentation piece is always extremely positive. Then the questions are always rather critical, but the answers are again very, very positive. So being able to kind of find meaningful alpha, meaningful signal in that is, uh, is challenging. And well, it's, it's worthwhile, it's a worthwhile exercise, but we thought it was interesting to look at this particular kind of on the ground data set. And uh, that's what we worked with uh, Extract Alpha on. So the data set spanned about fi five years and we had about 800 question and answer pairs that we were, 800,000 question and answer pairs that we looked at. So how did we approach this? So first we try to identify references to company names. So because we are working with interviews, questions asked to suppliers and resellers, these suppliers and resellers, they may be serving or reselling uh, for multiple of our actual companies that we wanna um, build a predictive model for. So the first task was to identify which records, which interview Q&A pairs were referring to which particular companies. So that's where that Facebook ad example came from. So that's where we were able to use Ino to uh, look at the concept level and have a much higher precision in kind of linking Q&A pairs to actual companies. Second step was to detect sentiment. Because the, well, the question didn't really uh, carry as much sentiment and it also wasn't entirely relevant, we chose to only look at sentiment in the answer text. And if we found an overlap between a reference to a company and a sentiment attribute, we increased the weight for those records. And then with that, that gave us like a positive sentiment and a negative sentiment score. We uh, came up with this diffusion score that kind of combines that in this simple formula. And then we started to look at, uh, we started to correlate that against uh, the sales information that we had for the companies that were referenced. So the outcome of that result was uh, so we were measuring this, diffu this diffusion score and then diffusion change. So how did it evolve quarter by quarter? <clears throat> and we uh, measured that or we correlated that against sales growth and EPS growth as well as uh, surprise, which is how, how much it differed from what was expected. And there wasn't that much correlation to the surprise ratios, but there was a very significant correlation here to sales growth. Now, I can hear some people in the room thinking, well, correlations, didn't they go up to one? And you're saying that 0.26 is, uh, is good? Well, so Extract Alpha is, uh, is a specialist here and they were really impressed by the numbers they caught here. And if, you, if you're thinking about um, identifying the correlation between somebody's body weight uh, and their, their length, their height, um, to create a predictive model that predicts how, how tall somebody is, well, you would expect to see a correlation factor that gets very close to one. But if all you have, if all you know about a particular person is the Facebook po posts he, he puts in or what other people post about him on Facebook, then maybe that point 26 is really relevant. And if that is something that comes on top on all of the structured data about sales that you may have about a particular company, then maybe that's something that can push the needle and that can give you that particular alpha, that particular signal that, um, that can help you make sensible and, and, uh, and rewarding investment decisions. So another graph how, uh, how we uh, presented this was by binning the, the diffusion into 10, 10 groups, 10 uh, equal groups. So these were the ones where the diffusion was highest. And then we plotted the EPS growth and sales growth. And you can see that despite from a little bit of noise on the, on the lower end where there was hardly any any sentiment information that we were able to capture, you can see that it kind of grows nicely and that there's a nice uh, correlation between diffusion and actual sales growth. So results of, the, of this project. So we've, uh, together with uh, Extract Alpha and the research provider, we've defined a minimal vi viable product and a general outline of the solution. Um, we're in talks about the commercial agreements and uh, the sort of audience we're targeting. So we're not gonna look for the typical fundamental audience that this company was, uh, was previously targeting, but now we're gonna look at a more quantitative analyst audience or quantum mental, which is uh, sort of in between uh, quantitative and fundamental financial analysis. 
And so we're, we're, in, uh, we're in the talking phase, but the, the, the results, that I, the correlation was, uh, spoke for itself. Uh, what was really rewarding from this exercise was that we were combining specific expertise from three companies that hardly knew one another before. So the research provider, they had very interesting research context, but they only focused on that fundamental research, meaning that they write reports, they interview people, and they write reports. They're not into the numbers game. Extract Alpha, they were into the numbers game, but they didn't have the data. Um, they didn't have that specific type of data that this research provider brought to the table. And we had this NLP software that allowed you to work at a concept level and that allows you to pull in kind of context such as the sentiment and uh, such as that sentiment information. So kind of wrapping up as a summary of the, of the use cases. So in the first use case with uh, HBI solutions, we worked on patient risk modeling, starting from clinical notes, looking for particular trigger concepts in a automated way through kind of uh, domain agnostic feature selection algorithms. But taking into account the, the, the context, we uh, were able to already identify a couple of gaps in coding and we're, uh, we're, real, we're still waiting for, uh, for the, the full data set in order to be able to kind of have some uh, precision and recall numbers to quote here. Second use case with extract alpha, we were predicting um, sales, uh, sales performance based on uh, fairly distant input in, this, in, the, in the form of industry interviews. And we eventually found a, a 0.26 correlation score, which was really interesting and which we're now in talks to kind of offer as a, as a, as a product. So what does that mean? So what is that, how to tie that back to the technology story from the beginning? Um, we're really here to provide you with an open analytics platform, with um, a, a platform that allows you to leverage the tools you like, to leverage the experience you have, uh, without kind of forcing you to, to stick to just the tools that we develop, but also allow you to tap into best of breed uh, solutions out there on the market by providing connectors and support for industry standards. Um, that allows you, as was perfectly uh, illustrated by the second use case, that allows you to, expert, to leverage your expertise, and uh, we're just here to, to give you the technology foundation, and you can leverage what you know best, and uh, what you know way better than we than, uh, than we do. It's also important to not forget about the, the importance of the, of the training data. So uh, HBI's models uh, work really well based on the structured data out of Health Insight, and it looks like we're, we're able to kind of even increase the precision a bit more by also starting to include that unstructured data. Um, so, uh, but, but also it's, it's important to not forget that the the, the, the volume of data is, uh, is really something that helps in, in, in machine learning. So it's, it's hard to reach a point where adding more data is not going to further increase your precision anymore. And then finally, it's not just about the analytics. It's also about the expertise that different parties bring to the table. It's, all about, it's also about being able to take those models back into your production environment and being able to, um, to, to run them somewhere else. For example, in the, in the second use case, well, having these correlation figures is great, but you have to have a product that quantitative researchers are able to kind of work with when they make these split-second transactions on the, on the financial markets. And then it's also important to have those analytics be supported by a scalable platform. So with that, it's almost time to do your own analytics and do your own machine learning on the, on the, the, the roulette table and the blackjack table. So I'm wondering if uh, anybody has any particular questions here at this point. Sorry? It's subject, oops. Thank you, Frank. Any other questions? Do 
in the Well, in the in the case of uh, of HBI, I think one of the, the the great things you have is that you you have that workflow all set up, and it's it's almost as simple as pushing the button to kind of retrain it f based on the on the information. So that's so that obviously holds for supervised learning when you have input data for which you know the outcome. Um, but in that case, as soon as you have amassed new data, you can just uh, rerun the the workflow, and uh, and you'll have a, a model that's kind of recalibrated. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how you retrain that for the, the yeah. different. Maybe to that, in order to rerun these things, that's also where having a good framework uh, makes a difference. Uh, for example, if you're if you're working with barebone R, um, you're programming yourself all of the steps. You can obviously save your save your scripts, and there are tools that work on top of uh, R that will help you. But uh, but if you look at a slightly more uh, higher level framework like Spark Machine Learning, you'll uh, you'll have you can define pipelines. You can uh, that will take care of hyperparameter tuning for you by just rerunning and retraining with different uh, hyperparameter values, and then uh, just at the end of a potentially very long time, uh, tell you which combination of parameters was, uh, gave the best results. So that's, that's, again, a tool choice. And as I try to make clear with that Open Analytics Platform ID, we're not here to do all of that work. We're here to give you a foundational basis where you can store your data safely and efficiently, uh, on top of which you can deploy the tools of your choice that support those particular workflows in an effective fashion. Okay, that gives us like 50 more seconds for you to, oh no, that's, oh, it's, it's counting up, so I'm over time. Sorry about that. So good luck on the, in the casino, and uh, thanks all for questions and contributions. Thanks. <laughs>